Hello comrades, it's Comrade Rhys here and today I'm going to be talking about the 2018 Winter Olympic Games that happened in Pyeongchang in South Korea recently. Most of you would have, without a doubt, been watching the Winter Olympics this year and all of you must have noticed that both North and South Korea were in the same Olympic team and waving the reunification flag. Personally, I think it is good that North and South Korea were in the same team as it would kind of create a path of peace and maybe even reunification on the divided Korean peninsula. And this year's Winter Olympics will surely go down in the history books. But in this video, I won't be talking about bobsleighs and ski jumping. All I'll be talking about is the politics behind the idea of North and South Korea being in the same team. The reunification of Korea is something that is dear to the hearts of the people of both North and South Korea, which have been separated since the end of the Second World War. Believe it or not, it was actually US President Donald Trump's complete idiocy and lack of diplomacy skills which was what contributed to this year's historic Winter Olympics. Donald Trump's threats to launch a nuclear attack on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea that have been his response to the country's growing nuclear capacity have made the most negative effect on the DPRK's neighbours, particularly South Korea. While the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was upgrading its nuclear deterrent to make it clear for US imperialism that if the DPRK were to be attacked, it would certainly respond by effective targeting of any city on the US mainland. Unfortunately, US imperialism simply could not, or should I say would not, accept that it was not possible to prevent such a tiny country, such as the DPRK, from defending itself. Therefore, Trump and his advisers came up with the concept of the bloody nose, which was a limited strike on the DPRK that would frighten the country into doing whatever the US imperialists demanded them to do. Just hours before his State of the Union address on Tuesday, North Korea's reckless pursuit of nuclear missiles could very soon threaten our homeland. President Trump's administration dropped its plan to nominate Victor D. Cha for the ambassador to South Korea. Cha had a fallout with the administration over a plan to carry out a preventive military strike against North Korea. He's against what he called a bloody nose strategy in a Washington Post op-ed. He argues the administration is pushing for it. As part of a reoccurring annual military exercise, the US and South Korea conducted drills that simulated strikes on North Korean nuclear and missile testing sites. And the US military itself has been quietly prepping for a last resort war with North Korea. The idea behind the bloody nose strategy is to use military force against North Korea, but not so destructive that it would trigger a retaliatory strike. The most obvious target would be a nuclear site, but many of North Korea's missile building sites are unknown and others are buried too deep underground to reach. Proponents argue that an early limited strike could make North Korea think twice about continuing its nuclear program. On the other hand, it could be that floating an airstrike combined with saber-rattling rhetoric is just an elaborate psychological operation designed to get inside Kim Jong-un's head. But Cha and other experts have previously contended that a military confrontation is ill-advised. This is not firing 59 Tomahawk missiles at an airbase in Syria right, or dropping a bomb on a set of bunkers in Afghanistan. This would be uh, this would be a, a conflict like we have not seen. His fear is that a bloody nose could quickly turn into a full-blown war. Since a lot of people, including myself, do strongly believe that Donald Trump is fucking insane, I personally think that he would be the type of person who would put the bloody nose idea into practice. And also, since a lot of people do agree that Trump is insane, panic spread like wildfire through many countries which are allies with the United States, South Korea in particular. Luckily, for now at least, this fear was compounded when at the end of January, the Trump administration abruptly dumped its appointee for US ambassador to South Korea, Victor Cha, after he voiced opposition to a preemptive strike on the DPRK. Victor Cha subsequently went public, writing a comment in the Washington Post in which he warned that a US attack would put 230,000 Americans in South Korea at risk, which is equivalent to a medium-sized city like Pittsburgh. 
Victor Cha, of course, may only have been bothered about US citizens being at risk because it would not be possible to evacuate them. South Koreans, however, could not resist asking, what about us? The Seoul metropolitan area's 25 million residents, including 200,000 US citizens, are vulnerable to North Korean conventional attacks, given its location a mere 35 miles from the demilitarized zone. It really does seem that the Trump team have been toying with the illusion that if they went for a only limited strike, the DPRK would not hit back because to do so would obviously condemn the entire country to obliteration. The whole nuclear issue has demonstrated to South Koreans that US imperialism really does not give a shit about them, unlike the government in the North, which has pointed out that its nuclear weapons would never be used against the South. Therefore, this is the background to the DPRK being invited by the South Korean government to participate in the Winter Olympics that took place in February in South Korea. The DPRK consistently with its policy of doing everything in its power to promote the harmonious reunification of Korea as an independent state free from imperialist interference acted promptly. Comrade Kim Jong-un in his New Year's speech said, This year is significant for both the North and the South. As in the North, the people will greet the 70th founding anniversary of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea as a great event, and South Korea host the Winter Olympics. In order to hold such great events of the nation with great success and demonstrate the dignity and spirit of the nation at home and abroad, it is necessary to improve the frozen inter-Korea relations and decorate this significant year as a year of great importance to be specially recorded in the history of the nation. As a responsible nuclear power loving peace, the DPRK will neither use nukes or threaten a country or a region with nukes as long as the aggressive hostile forces do not encroach upon the sovereignty and interests of our state. However, we will resolutely cope with any acts disturbing peace and security of the Korean Peninsula. The Workers' Party of Korea and the government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea will develop good neighbor and friendly relations with all countries which respect the sovereignty of our country and are friendly towards us and make positive efforts to build a just and peaceful new world. The Workers' Party of Korea and the DPRK government will not stop their struggle in advance until the final victory of the revolutionary cause of Juche is accomplished, relying on the trust and strength of the people, but bring earlier at any cost the future of a powerful socialist country where the entire people enjoy a dignified and happy life. The South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, was quick to respond, agreeing not only that the DPRK should participate in the Winter Olympics, but even more significantly that planned aggressive US-South Korean joint military exercises that were due to take place would be postponed until after the games were over. The DPRK sent the most senior North Korean leaders ever to visit South Korea, namely its head of state, Kim Yong-nam and Kim Yo-jong, who is the younger sister of Kim Jong-un. The 500-strong North Korean delegation included musicians, martial artists and cheerleaders, and about 22 athletes. All proved a great hit in South Korea, as the reality proved so extraordinarily different from what decades of anti-communist propaganda had led people to believe. The South Korean press were mesmerized by the cheerleaders, and journalists were determined to crack one of the great mysteries of our time. What are the North Koreans really like? Much to their amazement, they discovered that the most surprising thing of all is how calm, polite, and normal they really turn out to be. US imperialism, however, was pissed off big time, but all of its efforts to cast a shadow over the proceedings came to absolutely nothing. Mike Pence, who I think is Donald Trump's right-hand man, made efforts to demonize the DPRK, but found that those efforts backfired. The Times remarked, the most interesting element of the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics was not the performances in the stadium, but the drama in the VIP box far above it. What I found interesting in particular was that Mike Pence, representing the US government at the Games, let the fury of US imperialism show only too clearly. This sulk that Mike Pence had, 
had expressed itself in highly undiplomatic behaviour that raised eyebrows, even in circles most hostile to the DPRK and to Korean reunification. Before returning home, Kim Yo-jong had issued an invitation to the South Korean president to visit Pyongyang, and the representatives of US imperialism are having to console themselves with the thought that he did not immediately accept, with Mike Pence bragging that Moon Jae-in was as committed as the US to forcing the DPRK to give up its nuclear capability. But President Moon Jae-in had his own constituency to please, many of whom cannot have failed to realize that the DPRK's nuclear arsenal is deterring a US imperialist attack that would hurt not only the DPRK, but also South Korea. I really do hope that President Moon Jae-in will not allow himself to be bullied by the US imperialists into turning away from the path of reunification on which he has now embarked so boldly. He was, after all, elected because most South Koreans long for reunification. The DPRK's reunification policy is for a new state of Korea to be established, which would embody both economic systems, socialism in the north and capitalism in the south. A state which, however, would have no outside interference from any country in its internal affairs, and would certainly not tolerate the presence of foreign troops and weapons of mass destruction on its soil. Korea was unjustly divided after the Second World War, as a result of US imperialist occupation of South Korea. It is about time that injustice was reversed. The respected Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un received the members of the delegation led by a special envoy of the South Korean President. The Supreme Leader of the Party, State and Army of Korea, Chairman of the Workers' Party of Korea, Chairman of the State Affairs Commission of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and Supreme Commander of the Korean People's Army, received the members of the delegation led by a special envoy of the South Korean President who came to Pyongyang on March the 5th. Present on the occasion were President Moon Jae-in's special envoy Jong Uyong, Chief of the National Security Room of the Blue House, So Hun, Director of the National Intelligence Service, Chun Hae Sung, Vice Minister of Unification, Kim Sang Kyun, Assistant Director of the National Intelligence Service, and Yun Kun Yong, Chief of the State Affairs Room of the Blue House. Also on hand were Kim Yong Chul, Vice Chairman of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea, and Kim Yo Jung, First Deputy Department Director of the Party Central Committee. Warmly shaking hands with the Special Envoy and his party, Kim Jong Un ardently welcomed their visit to Pyongyang. The Special Envoy Jong Uyong, Chief of the National Security Room of the Blue House, courteously conveyed a personal letter of President Moon Jae-in to Kim Jong Un. The members of the delegation led by the Special Envoy thanked Kim Jong Un for having dispatched several large-scale delegations, including the high-level delegation, on the occasion of the 23rd Winter Olympics, so that the Olympics could be held with success. Kim Jong Un expressed the thanks for it and said, "It is natural for the fellow countrymen with the same blood to be rejoiced over the event of the fellow countrymen and help with each other." The recent Winter Olympics served as a very important occasion in demonstrating the spirit and grandeur of the Korean nation at home and abroad, and creating a good atmosphere for reconciliation, unity, and dialogue between the North and the South. Kim Jong Un had open-minded talks with the South Korean Special Envoy's delegation members concerning the issues on actively improving the inter-Korean relations and ensuring peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula.